Good afternoon, everybody. Richard, how are you? Good, how are you? Yes, very well, very well. Happy to be here in Barcelona. It's very nice. Um, I guess we should, we haven't got huge amounts of time, so I'm going to just dive straight in. Um, in relation to what Chris just said there about the early years, um, I actually didn't realise until a couple of years ago your, your very early beginnings, which um, I don't know if people here know, but were, were very rooted in rave culture. Um, just take us back, back to that sort of time. Uh, how and when did you start producing? How did you sort of pick up whatever it was, a, a computer and a, and a keyboard, and create your first track? From being a sort of teenage obsessive fan of hip hop, um, and initially make, well, trying to make hip hop records, and that being quite difficult and frustrating at times, and rave kind of coming along and being something that quite a few people found they could do. Um, it's got a bit of feedback there. Um, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, we, there, there was quite a few of us who just started making rave records and it was quite unconsidered and spontaneous and sort of making stuff quite quickly on quite primitive equipment, pressing white labels, putting stuff out, DJing, and that kind of leading into the label um, and it being a rave label with a bunch of people all doing, we were all doing the same thing, making rave records and putting them out. So you said it was quite difficult to make hip hop records, in what, in what sense? Well, it was difficult to make things that people were interested in. Okay. <laughs> I think it was, it was difficult at that time. Right. I mean, that's one of the reasons that the whole grime thing is so exciting now is because people are genuinely interested in the UK. You know, people are, and all over the world, people are excited by British rap music and grime now. But at that time, it was very, very difficult for British rap music to get listened to and get noticed. And it was completely, it was so centralised around the, the, the American experience, wasn't it? It wasn't, you know, I guess people weren't interested. Yeah, and I think around the world then, there were people everywhere trying to make rap records. Yeah. But it was very hard to really get heard and get noticed, even in your own country. Yeah. Whereas I think, fast forward 25 years, and every place in the world has its own rap scene, where people do get listened to in their own country. And people listen to American rap music everywhere, but they also listen to rap music yeah. from the country that, they, that, that, that they're in. And that's been, I, I, I've really enjoyed seeing that develop and evolve. So, so how come, I mean, I guess from a sort of technical point of view, how come, how come rave records were easy to make? I mean, what did you, uh, can you, can you remember the first time you sat down? Um, obviously, like Richard went off to, to, to be part of Kicks Like a Mule, who had, you know, numerous big hits. Um, back in the 80s, is it the 80s? Am I in the right timeline now? I was about to say, late, late 80s. Yeah, Start of the 90s, okay. yes. Um, but that very first record you make, so sort of take, us, take us into your, um, presumably your bedroom or your, your parents' spare room, whatever. What were you recording on? What equipment? And, and how did you sort of, how did you physically learn the, the very basic technical aspects of production? Well, I learned to, to DJ as a hip hop DJ. Um, and so that was about two copies of the same break and trying to, you know, you're trying to weave that together and make one track, which is very difficult. Yeah. So when I first got introduced to the sampler, I thought that was incredible because it made that process so much easier to, I mean, a sampler then was not easy compared to sampling technology now but it is easy, easy compared to trying to mix two bits of vinyl. Am I sounding okay, by the way? Because I'm hearing a lot of feedback up here. Can you hear me yeah, okay? Yeah, there's feedback, so. Um, so, uh, yeah, so the, so, so the equipment initially was um, an Akai S950 sampler, um, Cubase on an Atari, uh, recording onto that tape, and it was pretty much all samples. We didn't have much by way of synthesizers early on um, so yeah it was very very raw and we used to make records in a few hours um, it was very quick and you'd make them to go and DJ with and so you it was either good because when you DJ with it it worked or it wasn't good yeah and it was a very very simplistic minimalist kind of approach to everything where were you what sort of place were you DJing at back then are you talking about sort of like local local you clubby type things, or was it kind of like you know the wag in the West End? Where, 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 would, where would you actually go and play these? Well, records? I started DJing when I was 16. I started doing parties in North London where I lived, and then it, I suppose by the time I was actually making rave records, we were DJing at, at raves, and you know we were DJing all over the country um, at raves, and, and, and so a, a sort of combination of small events and big events, and um, but I mean that. You know, it was a real people scene, that scene. 
and it was a huge scene. It wasn't huge in the media, but it was huge in terms of people being really into it, really committed, and really excited about going out and dancing to records that weren't on the radio. It was, you know, it was an underground kind of culture, I suppose. Yeah. So, it, you, I mean, you mentioned the grime scene there. Is, was that, I mean, look, can you see similarities between punk, rave, and grime in, in, in the aspect that it was, you know, all very DIY? You would put these records out and and they would just chart. I mean, that was, which would be kind of incredibly hard to replicate now for various reasons. But back then, were you aware of how DIY the scene was? Were you aware of the scene kind of growing and filtering outside from London up to, you know, Birmingham, Manchester, Glasgow, whatever? How sort of aware were you of, of what was happening at that time? I mean, we were just doing it. So we definitely weren't thinking too hard about what was going on. And I think now if I saw a scene unfold like that, I think I'd be more sort of, uh, I'd see how incredible it is more than I could see that at the time because at the time we were just doing what we were doing and we were teenagers and uh, we were just in it, completely in it, completely spontaneous and that's what made it what it was. Um, but yeah, it was. I, I, you know, I, I wasn't around for punk, I was too young for punk but I, I'm sure punk and then rave and then grime and then jungle, I think, you know, these, yeah. jungle before grime, but, but these things were like, these scenes all had some similar elements to them of being kind of from pirate radio from the street and there being just incredible incredibly exciting music coming out of it but very production based label based more than artist or vocalist based most of it you know through through rave and, and jungle anyway and then grime it becoming more about mcs and artists but still yeah. with the producers playing a very important part do you think this is a conversation that's come up quite a lot, a lot with me over the last week or two, and, and even at Sonar. Do you, how do you how do you sort of see um, if something like if something were like if something like um, Ray were to ex exist now? Do you feel uh, with all the innovations we have, with the amount of what the amount that goes on in the digital world, the, the way that scenes are sort of created and disseminated at the moment, it feels like it's very hard to get a foothold as a scene um, because before it's had chance to develop and discover itself. People have been writing about it, people have tweeted about it, Instagrammed about it, decided they like it or they don't, and then they're on to the next thing. I mean, do you sort of, do you see those changes? Can you, do you sort of identify with that, that it's kind of harder, it feels harder now to create something that's a little bit more lasting than it was back in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s? Well, I think it, it, it just is how it is, and it's got its advantages and it's got its disadvantages. I think it's easier to get heard. It's easier to get heard everywhere. And uh, the downside of that is the media tends to be onto things so they don't have as much time to incubate before they become a bit more public. But I still think there's stuff going on out there that people haven't discovered. People just think they've discovered everything. Is everyone still here? Oh, are they... Wow. Are they, are they still working? Still here? Has everyone still got ears left? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I've lost. What? Well, yeah. Did you, you finished what you were saying. Uh -huh, okay. Yeah. Fine. All right. So we're back. So back in those back in those early years. Um, I'm assuming it was all very exciting, very new. Uh, at one point, did you did you start the idea of, of forming a label? Um, you know, the prodigy obviously were, were around. We were beginning to form around that time. You met Liam. How, so tell us, talk us through those years a little bit. How that? How the sort of the the early years of of Excel as a label, but also that sort of rave scene developing and your sort of part in that. It really was an extension of the DJing and of, you know, having records that we could play as DJs. And there were three of us at the label, two of us were DJs, and um, four of us at the label, two of us were DJs. And, and yeah, the stuff that we could play were the things that were relevant. And we used to go around giving, giving acetates and white labels to other DJs, and it was all completely based on that. It was just a DJ-based uh, culture. Um, and Prodigy, you know, I think uh, Liam Howlett was an incredibly good producer, was probably was the best of those uh, producers in that scene. And he also had a vision kind of beyond that. And at a certain point, scenes can also get a bit confining. You know, it starts off as a platform and then it becomes a bit of a prison. So then it's, then you want to go beyond that. And, and right. I think Prodigy, you know, Liam just took the music way beyond Rave. And also Rave, was, Rave became quite corny quite quickly as well you know scenes get commercialized yeah. and I think now people would say well that happens because of the internet but it was always happening those that, that's just what happens you know so the question is there a way of avoiding that do you think 
um, I think things kind of run their course, don't they? And people, you're making interesting stuff, you're in a scene, and then you find something else, and you grow out of it, and you move on. And, you know, Aphex Twin was quite close to that scene as well and was making records that were for that scene, but he had a, you know, he was a genius who was going to make incredible stuff, and it stopped being part of a, of a scene. But, you know, I'm, I'm interested in sort of music making and musicians, and, this, the, you know, the scene itself is like, it, it is what it is. You know? yeah. So what were, you, what were you learning about back then? Because um, I imagine things were happening at quite a fast pace. Um, from an outside point of view, the, the, the success of the prodigy seemed to be fairly immediate, um, and they sort of exploded and had this huge effect on British music at that time and even around the world. Were you sort of able to, were you, were you sort of looking at what Liam was doing and learning from him about producing? You know, were you sort of looking at how you would, at any point in the future, perhaps build what was you know very small independent label into a very big independent label i mean how, how what were you learning about them what, what sorts of things were you picking up? well i think they definitely their greater responsibilities came with you know an artist on the label becoming as big as that which okay. you know i kind of felt like i had to deal with i didn't particularly enjoy it because i sort of stopped being in the studio for quite quite a long time then and stopped making anything and kind of felt like I had to run a record label and sort of do that, which was quite a, an attempt at being a bit more grown up than I was necessarily that. I mean, it was, it, and it worked and that was great and I'm sort of appreciative of how that's worked out. But then I, I think it, once I've been able to kind of build a, a team of people there and there were people at Excel who really understood the ethos of it, um, once I felt I was able to be back in the studio and let the label be quite self-contained, that was that worked well for me personally and I think it's worked well for the label as well. What was, what was the ethos? What, 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 was, what, was it that, what was it that you wanted to ensure that in your absence people were able to continue without you having to sort of oversee everything? I think, we, I think you know, I mean, I've been pretty solidly in the studio for the last five years, I suppose, and I think we'd established an, just an artist-friendly outlook and it being small and resisting all the temptation to get really big. Um, keeping it to a really small number of artists and just being really putting a strong kind of message out there on the behalf of the artist you work with like being able to help them kind of realize their true sort of nature and then put it out there and not dilute it and not encourage people to do bullshit things that they don't want to do and just put you know that start that definitely started with prodigy um because they they had a very specific strong way they wanted to do things and I think those, that's what I'm attracted to as artists who have a strong way they want to do stuff, who don't want to conform to, you know, what the radio wants or what you're meant to, you know, I think all those things don't count for as much as people think they do. That sort of more conservative way of looking at um, how to put music out. I think, there's, I think if you're good enough, you can go right around that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you said, I mean, one of the things that Prodigy didn't do was, was things like press. Um, they didn't. They didn't do like top of the pops or whatever. I mean, is that something that, that perhaps artists can learn from now in terms of the constant exposure that um, that we are subjected to, sometimes willingly, as as, as audience uh, audiences. But in terms of you know, an artist now, it's it's not just um, turning up and doing a couple of interviews and maybe doing a TV show and a radio show. It's a constant stream of Twitter, Instagrams, Vine, Meerkat. Uh, you know, the, it goes on and on. How do you how do you sort of would you like to see a return, perhaps a little bit more, to the stepping back of artists in some ways? I mean, or do you think it's a necessary evil in order for producers, no. not just artists, but producers? I mean, this is, you know, from your, as a producer as well, the sort of things that you're expected to do as an artist to, to promote your own. Yeah, you are, you are expected to be very exposed now. And I think that's got its dangers and that, that potentially discourages some artists who might not be that well suited to that and it might be more kind of sensitive. I think people have to think quite hard about how exposed they want to be and how out there they want to be, because a lot's expected of you. But at the same time, I think you can say no to it, and I think you can, you know, you don't have to do anything. Um, you don't have to engage with any social media you don't want to. Yeah. Um, but, you know, everyone's life is lived in a more public way now anyway, and that's got some really good things to it, and, and some things that are a bit of a challenge come with that. Yeah, I mean, it's true. I mean, it's like everyone's mum's on Facebook now. Pretty well, actually, my mum is not on Facebook, but, you know, it, it is, it's, it's a sort of pervasive throughout, I guess, through, through all, every, every, whatever your job is, that's kind of, 
is part of our lives now. So just take it, so from so from the years of, of Apology to working with Gil Scott Heron, there was there was quite a gap. Um, you stopped producing effectively around around the sort of mid nineties. Why was that? What happened? Uh, that was just because the you know I was busy sorry, with, a, with, with busy with the with label, the label. Okay. Um, and it was you know that was an incredibly productive time where you know productive in other ways of working with some really amazing artists and just building the label up. Um, and then, you know, there wasn't any plan to any of that. I mean, that's, that's what happened. And I kind of moved away from being in the studio and then sort of around 2001, 2002, I think, you know, actually having a laptop, having reason on a laptop and then having logic and kind of relearning how to make music. And I really enjoyed that technology when it came around because first time around we've been using these more primitive things and I, I preferred the new technology. I mean, I, I mean now I, I use a real combination of things and a combination of some analog things with, uh, with more you know, straightforward modern ways of doing it. But I did find it incredibly liberating to be able to use um, uh, specifically, particularly logic when that came along as a way of being able to sample really easy and also record performances. And uh, so uh, yeah, I, I, got, I got a lot out of that. How long did it take you to, to sort of master it as a, um, I actually like when I first started using Logic. I thought it was there was a lot to it, and I actually enrolled in a sort of college course. And I okay. did a college course, and then I, and then he was asking about what you all did for your sort of day jobs. And when I started explaining it, it was quite awkward, <laughs> and people were like, "What?" Because like, well, yeah. it was all people who wanted, you know, wanted to be musicians. But I kind of thought, well, that's you know, I want to learn about this stuff, and I need to, you know, and. Uh, um, it was yeah, it was good. It was good to do that. And then, I, but I think different different bits of equipment and different bits of software and different programs. They like it depends on what your brain's like. So for someone, logic will be very complicated, and for someone, it'll be very straightforward. Um, Ableton will make more sense for someone else. Ableton will be difficult to use. Right. You know. Um, so I think people have got different things that they like, and I, I, I prefer using logic. Although they've, they've changed it quite a lot, I prefer using logic to. Anything else? Is there a reason? I mean, is that is that is there a technical reason as to why, or is it sort of just how your brain works? Is it just the way it's set up? Like you, you were saying, some people find this easy to use, some people find that. Is it sort of like a left brain, right brain thing, or a uh, more tactile thing, tacit thing? Well, I think it's it's easy to it's easy to use and manipulate samples. It's easy to manipulate sound, and you can also capture performances um, in a way that's possibly not. It's not as geared towards capturing performances as Pro Tools is, but you can you can do what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So, so when you went back in the, when you went back and, and started learning uh, Logic, um, how how on earth did how on earth did Gil Scott Heron? How did that whole project come around come about? Uh, it just it, it occurred to me that I'd like to hear a, a new Gil Scott Heron record, and that I had a feeling that was quite unlikely to happen. Um, so I kind of felt like I should try and do something about it. And I just sort of took it upon myself, really. I wrote to him and I went to see him. And um, yeah, it kind of felt like he was expecting me to turn up. It had its sort of cosmic aspects to it. Um, and um, yeah, I put it to him that we should make a record. I mean, it was definitely quite out of my depth in doing that as a right. producer at that time. And also first time round with Rave, I wasn't producing other people. We were just making stuff, you know, we were just, you know, making beats and making noises whereas the to, to produce an artist especially one with his incredible sort of depth is another thing mm. um but i'd worked with a lot of artists by then so i kind of i sort of i was in the habit of communicating with quite heavyweight artists and uh so i was definitely out of my depth and i was quite scared about it about the doing of it uh but i knew it was the right thing to do and he was into us doing it and i think he just instinctively saw that we were going to do something and it was going to be all right because I mean he'd said no to everything for probably 15 years yeah, at that point um, so yeah we were able to do it and, it and it kind of felt felt right although yeah I was extremely out of my comfort zone and doing it anyway and I think that was um, you know you can get a lot and grow a lot out of being in that situation what was so what was what was it do you think that you how were you able to persuade him that this would be well not persuade him necessarily but like uh, enlighten him that this would be something that that would be creatively very productive for you both I mean what is it what was it that you think he responded to when you went to meet him 
I mean, at one stage he said, you know, you don't just appear in your own dreams, you appear in other people's dreams, and this is your dream to do that, and I'm appearing in it. <laughs> and so that was, you know, he, I think a large part of him doing it was, I didn't, I didn't talk him into it at all. Yeah. I kind of said this is something that would be good to do, and he was kind of like, okay. He was, he, he, and I think he felt like we got on and there was a connection there and we could do it and it would probably work out all right. Um, and I mean, he was very happy like watching basketball and being at home. He didn't really feel like, and he still, you know, he was always playing live and he kind of felt like that was his thing. You know, Girl Scott Heron have made like 13 records in 12 years or something. It's such a great body of work. But he kind of said it, he said a lot in that time, more than most people say in their whole careers. Um, you know, so that, yeah, so he, he was pretty like laid back about it, I suppose. So why, I mean, obviously his legacy at that point um, was, was very assured, very cemented. Why do you think it was, it was Gil Scott Heron that you were sort of, as your first major project, why was it him that you focused on, um, given, like you said, he had this huge legacy, he'd said so much. What was it that you thought that you could create that was interesting together? I don't know, I just had the idea that we could make something good and there would be a good combination. I didn't know what it would be or what it would entail. It was just a kind of instinctive idea and that is generally what I work on the strength of is instinctive yeah. ideas. And, you know, the idea was to suggest to Gil that we made a record together. That was the idea. Yeah. You know? and, and he was up for it, so it happened. Sometimes I guess that's the, the, the sort of the most simple approaches and the most simple ideas uh, that are the most unforced. I guess are the ones that end up being the most productive, or can I mean, be. I think if you've got if you've got an idea about collaborating with someone, it's you know, and you approach it in a way where you're kind of um, where you're straightforward and you're like and you're passionate and you're honest with someone. There's always a chance that they'll work with you. I mean, I don't think Gil was working with me because of the label. I don't think he cared about record labels. I don't think he'd really have noticed it. I don't yeah. think it was of much interest to him. I think he was. He, and he wasn't working with me because of my background as a producer, because there wasn't really one then, apart from Rave Records, which he wouldn't have heard. I think he was up for working with me because he saw that I was serious about doing it, and I was up for, do, you know, and I wanted to do it, and I kind of was passionate about it. Um, and it was going to be, and it was going to be meaningful, and it was going to mean a lot to me to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, people will often really respond to that if you want to collaborate with them, if, you're, if your motivations are good. So what was the what was the process like? Where did you record the Where did you call the record? Um, was it here? Was it there? Where is it? Everywhere? Where did you? Um, we recorded uh, in New York. Mm -hmm. We started off uh, in a studio in Philip Glass's studio, which is called Looking Glass, mm -hmm. and then it closed. Yeah. So we moved to a studio called Clinton, and then it closed. <laughs> it was like the doors were like shutting behind us everywhere we looked. But I suppose it was a time when a lot of big studios were closing down, and we worked in quite nice studios. Um, and then I was going back and taking um, work back to London and editing and coming back out. So I was just kind of going back and forth to New York doing that for uh, a couple of years. Sorry, our monitors are feeding back a lot up, up here. Yeah, I keep still getting the feedback. Yeah. Um, and so how collaborative was the process? How, how involved and invested was, was Gil how, uh, in relation to you? Was he there a lot during the, the studio sessions? Uh, was he contributing sort of production wise in terms of ideas and the feel that he wanted to get? Well, we had this, we had this word Spartan, you know, which means devoid of anything unnecessary. Right. So we had a kind of word and that was like the production ethos for it. And it kind of worked from there really that we just wanted to make a quite minimal record it's very short half an hour long and every word had to really count and every note had to count um, and I think it was I think apart from how sort of uh, how much fear I had about it all apart from that it was really easy right. you know the actual making of it was, was was really easy I just felt very out of my depth but actually what we were doing worked very well and the music came together really well there's quite, I mean, there's quite a lot of space in your, in your music. I know space is, is a word that's sort of banded around a lot now. Um, or, oh, it's like the XX and stuff. But, but um, something that I noticed in what you did with Bobby Womack and Gil um, and, and your later work with Ibe, you don't, clutter, you don't clutter. You don't sort of 
overfill the track. Where's that? I mean, where's given how sort of the extreme of rave and kicks like a mule stuff being so incredibly like a sonic wall of just chaos in some ways. Where has that has that evolved through you outside of music? Has that evolved through you in terms of um, sort of a spiritualness in some ways, or you sort of strike me as sort of a, a like someone that perhaps like does yoga and you know you have a very calm sort of sense of well-being around you is that as you sort of as you sort of grew older not old but older uh, how did you sort of approach music in relation to how you were becoming as a person well I don't know if I'm really that calm it's more like a kind of is it a duck or a swan with the legs are paddling really, <laughs> okay. really fast underneath the surface um, yeah I, I, I like I like minimalism in music I do like space in music I like simplicity and especially if there's a great vocal performance there, I think often it's cluttered by too much other stuff. And I think there's a big influence of 80s hip hop there, of records that were just, they were minimal. And the rap performance was very visceral uh, and very vivid. And, and you know, there's records that were made really cheaply, you know, so there wasn't that much, you know, there wasn't an orchestra turning up. I mean, at the same time, I do kind of like to swing to that place as well, and, and like, it's sometimes good to do things that are more elaborate. Yeah. But I think where possible, minimalism is a great um, kind of, it's a great way to go and just strip things down to the essential basics. And then if, I think if that means it's less commercial in some ways, I think that's, that can be quite a good thing. It just gets people focused on what they're, on what they're hearing. And I think people are always kind of, cluttering things to try and get it on the radio or something and that's and that just creates a lot of unnecessary noise mm. and so, so what did you and what did you take away from from the uh, from that album from working with Gil what was your what, when you went next into the studio what did you take with you I just think I was back into making records then and that was it was kind of a, a turning point for me personally of feeling really comfortable being in the studio and feeling that that was what I wanted to be doing um, and that naturally just leading into other records that I've made since then have just kind of happened. The girl when I really went out of my way to sort of, I instigated it. And all the records I've made since then I haven't instigated, they just kind of, they've happened. Hmm. I think something that can be said about that record is the element of, um, for some reason the most kind of cliche word that comes to mind is uniqueness uh, or original I suppose. But how important is that to you as a producer that what you're creating isn't just a repeat or an echo of other things already passed. I mean, the, some of that record stands very much alone. Um, well, everything's influenced by other things. Of course. And no, nothing is not influenced. And and I like samples. And I actually, you know, I like it when people wear this, wear the obvious, the, wear the influences clearly, and kind of go, look, this is this is the influence, and you can hear it, and it's a sample. And you know, I think that's respectful to do that. Um, and I love I love samples. But kind of conversely, and the sort of dichotomy to that is like originality is the most important thing. Right. And I think to make something that's been made before is not, it's not a good idea. I mean, it's not necessary to do that. So I, th I, find, I think that's very important in lyrics to encourage artists to say things that haven't been said before. Uh, and in music for it not to be the same sounds. Um, but I think in working with music that's like sounds that are textured and found sounds, you often get that originality. Uh, because if you use found sounds, it's like each found sound doesn't sound like any other sound. Yeah. Um, and I think the texture and the dirt in records makes them unique. That's why listening to vinyl is such a good experience, because it's actually different every time. And you're getting a kind of layer of sound, actually, that you don't get listening to something digitally. So. Uh, yeah, and I, and I guess that sound of, although I consume music in all sorts of different ways, that sound of vinyl, especially that sound of listening to hip hop records on vinyl, yeah. which were samples in the first place, that you, you're hearing through all these layers of like yeah. hiss and dirt and crust, and the effect of that is like, it's, it can be very evocative. I mean, I guess ideally you'd like, I'm presuming if you'd like people to experience your music, it would be through the, through the vinyl format. Was that fair to say? I mean, that's if, if people are going to listen to something you've created, you prefer it to be through by vinyl than MP3. Uh, well, I think that you can't argue with the convenience of MP3, and we all, and like we all grew up listening to like the radio and it sounding crap, you know, or just small speaker. I mean, everyone, we all started off listening to things on 
cheap small speakers. Yeah. So I got no problem with that at all. I mean, I don't, some people feel like, oh, we spend all this time in the studio and then people listen to things on mobile phones. But I'm like, yeah, but we always listen to things on, we always listen to music on things that sounded shit. Yeah. So you That's like the teenage listening experience. When you taped it off the radio, taped it onto your TDK, the charts, yeah. and then you'd tape it for your friend, and then your friend would tape it for their friends. And, and that's, got, that's got some magic to it as well. Uh. Um, but then equally, if you can listen to something on vinyl on a nice system, you know, then that's great. I was in a, a place in East London called Brilliant Corners. Have you ever been there? That's that's Brilliant in, uh, Corners. Brilliant Corners in Dalston. But they've got, I was just there last week, and they've got these... Clipshawn speakers, which are the same speakers they used to use at the loft that David Mancuso used to use, and uh, and you listen to something on vinyl in there, it's unbelievable. I mean, the music just sounded yeah. incredible, and that's it's great to be able to do that. But at the same time, I mean, if something's good, and you listen to it on your phone, it will sound good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just just um, before we move away from um, from Gil Scott Heron, what are your what are your memories of him? Like when you think back to that time that you guys spent um, making the record in in, in New York. What, so if you were to paint a picture, what would be um, your main sort of visual references for your time spent with him? Well, I mean, he was he was very unpredictable. He was very funny, um, and I knew I was kind of privileged to be doing it. Although it was very difficult, I knew it was quite a kind of privileged experience that was for a finite period of time. And you know, he did have some stuff he wanted to say, and I felt like I was really pleased. I was there to to capture it. It was yeah. really, I mean, it was really magical, otherworldly kind of experience and quite challenging and quite, you know, uh, yeah, strange and great. How is, I mean, regarding of who the art, regardless of who the artist is, and you have worked with particularly iconic artists, you know, people that, that are in their older years, um, they're not, you know, sort of young and enthusiastic necessarily always, although I'm sure they're old and enthusiastic, but you're talking, you know, you're dealing with people that are quite legendary, um, Bobby Womack, Little Scott Heron, Lee Scratch Perry, these are all very sort of strong individual people with uh, strong in individual artistic intent. How do you manage the sort of fragilities of each, of each personality when you were in the studio with them? How much of yourself do you have to sort of put to one side and work around what you're dealing with? I mean, they're people you can learn a massive amount of. I mean, you're going to be able to learn more from Gil Scott Heron or Bobby Womack yeah. than you are then you probably are working with someone your own age or working with someone younger. But then you get different things from working with someone, you know, from working with teen. I mean, I've worked with a, a few teenage artists and learned a huge amount of them, which, yeah. was, which are kind of different things to learn. Um, but, I mean, the Bobby Womack experience was like completely different in that he really, really wanted to make a record. He really wanted to make a record, be out there again, be heard again. Gil, Gil wasn't really that fast. He was kind of up for it because I'd yeah. suggested it. But he was equally happy just being at home watching basketball, not doing anything, and being completely out of the spotlight. And Bobby really felt like he had something else to say, he wanted to make a record, and was really like happy to be able to turn up and do and be him. Because he felt like through his career, people had said, you should be this, or you should be that, you should try being more this. And he'd had bad experiences with the music industry. And I think in working with me, and, and you know, Damon Albarn, who really kind of put that together through working with Bobby with Gorillaz and then really brought me into that project. Um, Bobby would say like, ah, it's you know, I've got, I've got these ideas and you're really open to them and that's amazing. And we were saying, well, what, how else could we do this? Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, because people have always said you should be doing that or should be doing this. And we weren't saying that, we were just saying, what do you want to talk about, what do you want to say? And he, you know, he had to like spiritual, old spiritual songs um, some of which we used on the record that were amazing, you know, uh, and we wanted him to tap into like the deep roots of of his and kind of bring it out there. And also, we wanted to create a platform for him that was, you know, modern but in keeping with it. I wanted the when I'm working with an artist, I want the I want the music to love them, right? You know, you can't it can't just be radical for the sake of it. Yeah, it's got to work as a as a whole, but, but, but also whilst trying to push things, sonically trying to push things, and trying to push things forward a bit. So that's the, um, that's the challenge, trying to push things forward, but keeping them relevant for the artist you're working with, yeah. and where you're not taking it away from the message that the artist is trying to convey. So when you look back on that record, how do you, how do you feel about it now? When you, do you still play it? And when you do play it, what do you, what do you think? Bobby's record. Bobby's record, sorry, yeah. Um, 
I don't listen to my old stuff much. I kind of listen to stuff I'm in the middle of and listen to other stuff that I find inspiring. Um, but I did hear, I heard Please Forgive My Heart from the Bobby Womack album last week. And I, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you can't really say with your own stuff. I mean, but you know, he, his performances are great on that record. His yeah. voice is really, really strong. And, um, you know, being in a room, just hearing, I mean, that was a phenomenal experience working with him. It was just such a treat to be in a small space listening to him sing. His voice was just such a sort of otherworldly instrument, you know, and he's, his expression of things was just amazing. And he was really, he really had it all. It was totally intact. His guitar, you know, he, he said that early on. He was like, my voice is completely intact. My guitar playing has gone a bit wonky. <laughs> yeah. um, but actually his guitar on the record, I mean, it is wonky, but it's really good. Yeah. It's unusual sounding, but his voice is just, you know, it's right there. It's as good as it ever was on that record. There's a really nice clip on YouTube that I saw of, um, of you guys in the studio, and he just looks, he does just looks incredibly happy to be there. Um, I think you we all were. Adjust, yeah. We all were. We were just thrilled to be doing it. I mean, for different reasons. I think it meant a lot to all of us for different reasons. Um, I think for Damon to not be the center of attention was refreshing for him, yeah. and to be in a background role was refreshing for him. Um, and I think for Bobby to be the centre of attention was was refreshing, because <laughs> I think he, you know, he hadn't had nearly the attention he deserves given how talented he he, yeah. he was. And was that you recorded that in London, presumably? With, we recorded that, that in in London at Damon's studio, yeah. And um, so that was at Damon's studio, I guess. But I I sort of popped to your studio a couple of weeks ago to have a sort of chat before we met up today, and I was kind of like, I mean, I'm not a musician. But even I could tell there was some exciting things going on in the studio. I don't know how much of this uh, the magician likes to reveal his, his his tricks. But can you talk a little bit through this sort of this sort of stuff that you that you do work on? There's the various 808s. Um, there's all this. I don't know musicians in here. I'm sure you'd be like, what? Because it's just everything just looks exciting. Well, it's, it's you know it's a mixture of old analog equipment and you know an analog desk. And then we use modern things and we use laptops and we use you know some new things um there's new things people are making brilliant equipment at the moment um uh the cr stuff like critter and guitar make and teenage engineering make um that i think is just incredible uh so yeah just trying to i mean we're in a very privileged position like that to be able to use really great old equipment and 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 to have you know when i have artists in um that they can access this, you know, brilliant equipment, and, that, and that's a, it's a great thing to have. But also to be open to like new things, some which are quite cheap, and some which are, you know, some which are, are, are more costly. But yeah, you know, I think that combine. I think that's that's what's uh, available, you know, as a combination. And I would never be purist about using old analog equipment, um, but equally, uh, I, I like being able to combine that the feel and the hands-onness and the tangible qualities of it um, with the speed and the convenience of using computers. Oh, we're sort of running fairly short on time, so I'm going to have to skip ahead to just to Ibe. Um, yeah. uh, one thing that you that you work a lot with is, is samples, um, uh, not not uh, sampling of people. So when you did um, the the Everyday Robots uh, album with Damon, there was there was some really nice vocal samples on there. And I know with uh, when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you were talking about when you went into the studio with Ibe, you played them some Elijah Muhammad. Is that right? To sort of inspire, just to inspire some creativity and some discussion around yeah. getting the record created. Um, how much, of, how much a part of what you do? How much of a part of the process is that? I mean, you sort of like you enjoy playing people samples of speeches and historical figures, as opposed to samples of, of music to kind of encourage dialogue in the studio. Well, I think both both are potentially useful, but I think you can, you know, you can pull a little bit of dialogue off YouTube, and if there's a bit of meaning in those words. If, if you're working with people who are trying to write lyrics, those things can be extremely useful in kind of sending them in a different direction or creating a theme for something to work on. Um, and I, yeah, I, I really, so I use, you know, samples of, 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 of vinyl and old speeches, but also, like I said, I mean, YouTube is an endless source yeah. of people talking about stuff. Um, and you can, you know, and I think to take a piece of that, and sometimes those things end up staying on records as part of records, and sometimes you can just kind of take them off because they've created some inspiration or created a mood or, or an idea. Um, I mean, the, the Everyday Robots song on Damon Albarn's album, that's a sample of 
Lord Buckley, who was like a kind of spoken word artist from the 50s, right. like a sort of jazz, he's an interesting artist, and he was saying, uh, we didn't know where we was going, but we knew where we was, wasn't it? <laughs> and that kind of, I think we both sort of related to that idea at the time we were doing that record, which was like, you know, just the sort of journey of things. And I think that, that was helpful in Damon going off and writing some really uh, very insightful and meaningful lyrics, those, you know, those samples. Um, there was also a sample from, uh, of Timothy Leary from like the reading from the, he did like a guide for, to tripping based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It was like how to trip in okay. a sort of constructive way. Um, and uh, he talks about the photographs you're taking and that was a sample we used that Damon wrote uh, a song based on. Um, we talked about playing a little bit of um, I Bay, which is the, the incredible duo that you're currently working with at the moment. Um, they've just, they've just uh, recorded a cover of a J Electronica song. Um, did you want to play, just to sort of close a little bit, do you want to play a little bit from the, the original to their live studio demo to, to the new version? Just maybe... Yeah, 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 we could do that. 30 um, seconds or I mean, this, was, this whole thing came about because of a song by J Electronica which is not a song that I worked on. Um, and they've ended up covering this rap record and making it into a completely different kind of song. So I'll play a bit of the J one. Um, okay. Oh. I think we have to, do we have to? There we go. Okay. okay. I think we're very low on time, so we might have to just uh, whiz through before we finish. I'm getting the... You've got sound there, I'm playing now. We should keep talking. Should we just finish with one question? I don't know, we could quickly throw it out to the crowd. If anyone's got a question, oh, that was the, music, the, the people and then he leaves the people and goes away and waits for the time. When that he can't secure it, then he returns to the people that uh, he had made himself a uh, man So I think that is a pretty good uh, answer. A tiny little bit of baby baby as we play. I think yeah. yeah, I think we we have to end it there. But I guess as everybody files out, we should play. Do to play the last of baby version? Just I think we have to we have to clear the stage imminently. Sure. So, so this is kind of what they turn. I'll say thank you to Richard now and for everyone for coming. Yeah, this is the uh, baby version.
Yeah. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.